I'm going to um, start by giving an overview um, of the um, two different Oxfam platforms that are presenting the webinar today, as well as the um, two um, child early and forced marriage programs um, who are represented um, on the webinar. And then we'll hear from Karen and Ronald, um, who are going to um, share some research from the More Than Brides Alliance um, baseline, which has just been completed in Pakistan. Um, and then we'll hear from Cecilia, who's um, going to present the findings from the um, Engaging Youth to Stop Child Marriage um, Youth Co-Creation Workshop in Indonesia. Um, and then hopefully um, we'll hear from Arati, who I think has joined now, so that's, um, uh, that's great to see her online. Um, so she'll be presenting on the findings from the Consultative um, Sexual and Reproductive Health Rights um, Research in Nepal. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A with the presenters, and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end for um, some discussions as well. Can I have the next slide? So, um, I'm going to give an overview of the two Oxfam platforms who are presenting this webinar. Um, so, first of all, um, Oxfam's Violence Against Women and Girls Knowledge Hub um, has a number of roles, um, but focuses on improving program quality and program coherence, as well as strengthening funding for... Um, Oxfam's um, Violence Against Women programs. Um, it also works on um, improving influencing work at um, national, um, regional and global levels. Um, Oxfam's just um, launched, um, I think in um, October last year, um, a new campaign on violence against women and girls called the Enough Campaign. Um, so it also works to promote and strengthen that campaign. And I've put a link um, there as well if you want to check that out. Um, and then finally, working on um, learning and knowledge management, including things like research reports, um, evaluations and learning events. Can I have the next slide? So the second um, Oxfam platform which um, is presenting the webinar today is the Youth as Active Citizens Learning Community. Um, so the, the role of this community is really to um, promote a focus on co-creation, on um, youth-led initiatives, um, promoting youth voice um, and supporting young people to be able to access and influence um, decision making within their lives. Um, so that's um, a role that it carries out both um, within Oxfam and bro more broadly within the sector. So um, the idea of that is that um, it works to connect Oxfam staff, partners um, and young people who are working on active citizenship um, with one another um, so that they're able to share their knowledge, their skills, um, their learning, experience and um, tools, etc. around youth active citizenship so that they can improve their impact um, and, and strengthen their resources. Um, and finally, um, the role is to support and facilitate those initiatives within Oxfam and more broadly um, that foster youth active citizenship um, as well as youth voice and agency. And I've put, um, again, two links there to our digital platform um, and our Facebook group um, if you'd like to find out more and, um, and get involved. Uh, can I have the next slide? So I'm also going to briefly outline the two programs, um, two major multi-country programs um, which Oxfam is implementing at the moment um, on child early and forced marriage, um, which has led to some of the research which we're going to hear from today and is also the reason why we're so keen to share our findings in the webinar. Um, so first of all, the Creating Spaces to Take Action on Violence Against Women and Girls program, um, or Creating Spaces for short, um, which is a five-year program which um, is aimed to reduce violence against women and girls as well as child early and forced marriage in six countries. So three of those countries we're going to be hearing um, findings from today, Indonesia, um, Nepal and Pakistan, but then also um, Bangladesh, India and the Philippines. Um, are included as well. Uh, can I have the next slide? So, um, the second programme which is going to be represented on the webinar today is the More Than Brides Alliance. Um, so this is also a five-year programme um, which is specifically focused on reducing child marriage and its impact on young women and girls. Um, it's based in five countries, so we'll be hearing research findings from Pakistan today, but it's also focused in um, India, Malawi, Niger and Mali. Um, so of these, we're only looking at Pakistan during the webinar today. Um, there are four alliance members as well as Oxfam. We work with Save the Children, um, Samavi and the Population Council. Um, and there's a, there's a holistic 
theory of change and related to the program, um, but two of the crucial components are around um, girls' empowerment and raising voice, and then also changing customs, traditions, norms and practices, which perpetu um, perpetuate child early and forced marriage, which is um, what we're going to be focusing on today. Can I have the next slide? So, um, we're going to flip back to our Google Doc. Um, again, I'll um, put the link in the chat box um, in case you're joining me now. Um, but if you can um, scroll down to the second um, second section of the Google Doc where it says check in one expectations. And um, can you write down what you're interested in finding out about today? Because we're really interested to hear what people's expectations are. But um, if you start with your name so that we know um, Who's, right, who's written the, the different expectations, and then um, hopefully we'll be able to match those to what we'll be looking at during the webinar. So, <clears throat> we have a couple of people saying, um, they're interested in finding about success stories and methodology, which is definitely something we're going to be looking at, and also um, hoping to hear from you as participants um, on, your, on what your success stories are. Um, so the, the role of information and communication for child protection. Um, how social norms vary between the three different countries that we're going to be hearing from today. The reality of the present context. Um, someone saying that they're interested in finding out about um, learning from work on social norms and gender justice, so good practices and lessons learned around um, child and early marriage. Um, what the government response is towards stopping child marriage, um, which is something we're definitely going to be looking at in our um, in our discussion. Um, so what we've learned so far on how to tackle child early enforced marriage. Um, findings on how and which subjects can be used for edutainment, um, and then the main findings of the baselines. Okay, um, so I think it's probably best if we move on, um, if Ronald I can have the next slide. So I'm now going to hand over to Karen and Ronald, who are going to be taking us through the initial findings from the More Than Brides Alliance baseline research. You, Imogen. Uh, hi everyone, um, so my name is Ronald and Imogen of course already introduced me but I'm a researcher uh, working at Oxfam Novib and I'm um, involved amongst others with the Modern Bright Alliance program in, uh, in Pakistan. Um, so I'm going to give a very, very brief overview of the program in, in Pakistan, uh, only one minute, uh, and after which uh, Karen will, will take over to discuss the findings of um, the, the research activities we've done so far, namely a quantitative baseline survey. Um, so to start, so the Modern, Base, uh, Modern Bright Alliance program uh, in Pakistan is implemented by, by Oxfam with our partners, uh, Bedari and uh, Indus Resource Center, IRC. Um, and we are working in uh, South Punjab and Interior Sindh. Um, child marriage itself, it's, it's widespread throughout the whole of Pakistan, but we see that in those two regions, um, it's, it's really uh, a high prevalence, a higher prevalence of, of child marriage. Um, at the beginning of the program, we um, conducted a desk review on the current literature and, and research that has been done on child marriage in Pakistan. Um, and we have found one small confirmation about how much of a multi-layered issue child marriage actually is uh, and that the various drivers for child marriage are ranging from social cultural to religious to to economic and, and also legal dimension. Um, and we also found confirmation that uh, social norms and values, uh, especially uh, in Pakistan, the notion of, of honor and, and tradition um, play a major role in, in households uh, uh, and, and the decision for parents actually to engage um, in, in early marriage um, uh, or, or forced marriage. Um, as part of the Modern Brights Lines program, so it's a five-year program, we're now in, uh, in, in the second year. Um, as part of the program, we have a, uh, a big learning and research uh, component. Uh, so we've designed a, a learning and research agenda. 
uh, based on the, the desk review bindings and also the experience of, of Bedari and IRC um, in the field. And amongst others, we uh, have included social norms in that, in the learning and research agenda. Um, and we aim to specifically focus on the longer term um, to, to get more insight in how actually the concept of positive defiance, so families that do not engage in early marriage, um, how it works. So what can we learn from those families? What, what are the characteristics? Uh, and how actually can we perhaps use it as, as, as a strategy to actually uh, reduce child marriage in Pakistan? Um, so we're still at the beginning of the program, so we've designed a various like uh, learning and research uh, components and strategies. Um, and of course the first one is uh, implementation of a strong baseline. Um, so we have implemented the quantitative part of that uh, recently. Um, and Karen will now, uh, Karen who, who has led and coordinated that baseline survey process will now talk about the findings that we've seen specifically focused on uh, social norms around child marriage. That's okay, please. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Karen. Thank you for introducing me, uh, both Imogen and Ronald. So as I said, I'm, um, I'm a specialist of uh, impact measurement in, based in The Hague. And I've been working together with uh, Ronald, but also with our colleagues in Pakistan and partners, of course, on, on um, conducting the baseline for the program. So how far are we now? Uh, last couple of months we have uh, conducted the baseline for the province of Sindh we have finished uh, and for the province of Punjab we are almost finished. So this is something I want to highlight before looking at the results because you see that uh, we have a little bit less of uh, amount of data for Punjab and now you know the reason of course. Um, uh, we've used a randomized sample and uh, we sampled uh, both girls and women between uh, 11 and 24 married and unmarried and their uh, respective household. So uh, this we've done because we of course, as Ron explained, one of the most, um, one of our, our interests in, in learning for the program is social norms. And because of course, um, child marriage not only lies with a girl, but also with her uh, reference groups or with her house, household, we really wanted to try to, um, incorporate both and that's why we chose to sample both and also use two surveys. So a, a girl survey for the girls and a household survey for the households. Um, and before we want to talk about the results, we want, quickly, want to, uh, quickly want to explain how we came to this design. And of course, before you want to measure social norm, we need to know what is a social norm. Thank you, Ronald. Um, this slide shows um, the definition which we used. So a social norm is an unwritten behavioral rule to which individuals prefer to conform on the condition, this is the most important part, on the condition that most people in their reference group confirm to it and that most people in their reference group believe they should confirm to it. So one example which is often used is baiting. So no, this, and it's never written that one should bait, but you know that you have to do it and you do it, but also on the condition that people around you bait and that people around you know that they or believe that they should bait. So this is the starting point. So we, this is a starting point that we used uh, for designing the conceptual framework around social norms. So you see that you have on the one side your behavior and what you believe that you should do on the other, on the other side the condition that other people um, what other people do and believe. Uh, thank you, Ronald, again. <laughs> um, so here you see this definition uh, in four categories. So the first two are behavioral and personal normative belief. These two are the more um, obvious ones. It's what the respondent does, so what is actually happening. And the other one is personal normative belief, what the respondent believes one should do. Um, what uh, defines or what uh, do you say distinguishes the analysis of a social norm are the questions of empirical and normative expectation. This is the condition. So what does the respondents believe others do? And what does the respondents believe uh, others think one should do? Uh, in our conceptual framework, we linked many or not many, uh, well, we linked questions to each concept, to each categ category. But for this webinar, we want to highlight one 
question per category. So for behavior, we highlight the question, what is your marital status? We've asked this to the girls. So what does the respondent does? What is actually happening? What is their actual marital status uh, aggregated in age and per um, province? Um, if we're looking at personal normative belief, so what does the respondent believe one should do? We've asked the household, uh, in some occasions, a girl marries before she is 18 years old. To what extent do you agree that men should marry above 18? So what, to what extent do you believe the, that the respondent believe men, so one, should do? So this is the, the question that uh, oper operationalized the concept of personal normative belief. Then we look at empirical expectation. Uh, what is so? What the respond? What does what does the respondent believe others do? So what does the household? Uh, we ask them what does the household know that is generally considered as an appropriate age for girls to marry in this community? So what do you think that um, others? So the community. What is happening in the community? And lastly, we have uh, the normative expectation. Uh, we, then we asked the household, thinking about the community, in, the people in your community, how many of them think it is good if a girl gets married before she is 18? So what does the respondent, the household, believe that others, community, people in the community think is good? So um, I, hope, I hope this is sinking in to everyone. We, of course, only have 10 minutes, very short. So I quickly want to jump to the results. Uh, first, the behavior one, the marital status. Here you see um, the yellow one is Sindh, the green one is Punjab. Uh, we've aggregated by age. Of course, we see that a number of girls, uh, more girls get married above 18, but we do see that child marriage, so under 18, is still prevalent. Um, more, you see that it's more prevalent than sin, but this can also be uh, linked to the fact that our data collection in Punjab is not finished yet. Uh, then we go to the personal normative belief. So what do you think you should do? Um, yeah, so what do you think that you should do? Um, there's the question, men should marry with a girl above 18 years old. For both Punjab and Sindh, we see that around 60% agrees that men should marry with a girl above 18 years old. But this, this is the green part. But the orange and the red part, that is uh, the answer of do not agree. So here we see that around uh, 10 to 15 percent of uh, households answer that they do not agree. So this is also somehow linked, of course, to the behavior. You see that people still, or that people answer that men marry, should marry uh, under 18, so they do not agree with the statement. And we also see that girls, um, that early child marriage is still prevalent. Uh, but now let's look at the, um, at the empirical and normative expectations, so also the wider community and the reference group. So we've asked what is generally considered an appropriate age for girls to marry in this community. So what is, what is happening in the community? And what do you think is happening in the community? Here we see also that for Sindh and Punjab, most people answer 18 and 20. But however, you also see that um, that still people answer that an appropriate age for girls to marry is under 18, also more for Sindh than in Punjab. Um, but yes, people still still answer it, of course. So there's still um, a general um, a general expectation that, or a, gen a general belief that uh, an appropriate age for girls to marry in the community is under 18. And lastly, looking at the normative expectation, what so what do you, the respondent believe the community think they should do. Uh, we've asked, thinking about the community, the people in your community, how many of them think it is it is it good if a girl gets married before she is 18. The green one is most, most of them. Uh, lighter green is a lot, a lot of, but not all. Yellow is around half. Uh, orange, some. Uh, red, not very many. And um, purple one is, I don't know. Also looking at this question, you see that more, more in Punjab, um, more people agree with the statement that people in their community uh, believe it is, it's good if a girl gets married before 18. This is lesser in Sindh, 
But still, here also we see that um, the expectation of a, of a household, of their community, it is that there, it's still prevalent that people um, think or have a, a, a belief that it's, it's okay for a girl to get married before she's 18. So this is, in, very, in super short, uh, an overview of what we've seen in these four questions. Um, so what can we say? Ronald, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so what can we say? Well, we see from these questions that around 10 to 20 percent of the girls married before 18, and uh, that also of the households, um, around 20 percent of the households believe that marrying a girl under 18 is okay. So we, and the same number we see in the wider community perspective, uh, which is the, of course the important component of a social norm. So we can say somehow that behavior and attitude are closely connected, or they seem to be closely connected. But can we state that there is a social norm around child marriage? Well, of course, more research is needed. We we have to uh, analyze all the other uh, questions and um, also link it to our qualitative components. So we have uh, more qualitative research components. But our first result seems to match our expectation that there is a social norm around child marriage. So this is, yeah, well, this is the end. <laughs> um, thank you. I hope that everyone um, finds it interesting, of course, and but also is more uh, thinking about it, and we'll see if you have questions or not. So I want to hand it over back to you, Imogen, I think. Sure, yeah, thanks very much, Karen. Uh, it was really interesting. and. Great to have a really thorough overview of the methodology as well. It's really helpful um, to see what you use to be able to get to these findings. Um, we're going to hand back to the Google Doc now, um, just to have a, a check-in after each presentation to um, make sure that people can park their questions so that they don't have to sort of keep them over the other presentations um, and can get them out waiting for the um, Q&A session, which will happen at the end of Cecilia's and Arati's presentation in about 20 minutes. So um, if you can open the Google Doc again um, and write in any questions you have, and if you could write your name as well when you write the questions, um, that would be really helpful so we know who's asking them. But, um, so we'll give, give you about um, one or two minutes just to write down any immediate questions that you have so that um, Karen and Ronald will be able to come back to them during the Q&A session in about 20 minutes. Okay, thanks a lot for your questions, which I can see are still coming in. Um, please keep going on those, but um, we're going to move on to the next presentation now, um, just for the sake of time, to make sure that we can get through everything. Um, so, I'm now going to hand over to Cecilia, um, and she's going to present on the findings from um, a youth co-creation workshop, um, which was undertaken, I think, um, last June, um, on engaging youth to stop child marriage. So, um, Cecilia, over to you. Thank you, Imogen. Hi, everyone. This is Cecilia from Indonesia, Oxfam in Indonesia. 
uh, I'm going to share a little bit about the co-creation workshop that we're doing with uh, youth in around June last year. So as Imogen said earlier that we are starting the Creating Spaces program aimed to end uh, violence against women and child early and forced marriage in Indonesia. In Indonesia, we're focusing a little bit more on a child early and forced marriage, but as the youth is the one that are most uh, influenced by this, so we decided that it's important to um, take in uh, the youth perception on this issue. So the co-creation workshop is aimed to be deeper on youth uh, perception on early marriage, but also to help us design a youth-centric intervention to stop the uh, child marriage itself. So we, in this workshop, we invited five women's rights organizations from throughout Indonesia uh, with 19 participants. Uh, most of them are youth from four provinces. Uh, we use uh, some methodologies to uh, scope the use perception itself, map the actors around child marriage, but most importantly, we determine the uh, root causes of child marriage, also the enabler factors behind uh, the high prevalence of child marriage in Indonesia, and also the impacts and how you, what you can do to uh, minimize the negative impacts. So during this workshop, uh, priorities is uh, obviously given to the youth to speak out because that's the whole point of engaging uh, youth early on in this process. Uh, next slide, please, Warno. Yeah. So we decided after talking with youth and even before that that child marriage is a very complex issues, but uh, there are some prevalent factors which come across uh, very strongly from all of the youth in the four provinces. The first one is religion is definitely a thing that is constantly used to justify child marriage, but the religion itself is not the issue uh, because it doesn't actually condone child marriage but the interpretation of the religious scripture does. Uh, the second uh, key factor is that there are not enough uh, sexual and reproductive health right education for youth. So uh, the approach that the parents and the uh, older people use to teach them about sexual and reproductive health rights are mostly making them feel threatened instead of being educated, so we need to change that. And the youth transmits more than knowledge. So uh, for example, like if you're only committing sex once, it will not result in pregnancy. And if you're marrying after the age of, in some areas, even uh, 13, you're considered too old to get married. So there's those uh, lots of myths around child marriage. There's also in a legal framework because our medical law doesn't uh, is not synchronized with our uh, child protection law. The child protection law states that a uh, child is anyone that is under 18, but the medical law states that uh, girls can be married at, legally as young as 16, while for boys it's 19. Even though there are uh, progresses, but efforts to make the legal frameworks more protective for girls against child marriage is not really that successful yet. Um, another thing is media has a very strong influence to support child marriage. So there are lots of uh, women activists that have been trying to talk about how child marriage is bad and everything. But in the other hand, there are also groups that are promoting uh, child marriage, so marrying early can be beneficial, those sort of things. And of course, there's always the obvious economical factors, because sometimes girls are uh, perceived as burden to the family, economical burdens, but also because there are a dowry system in most part of the Indonesia that uh, offers parents uh, easy money when marrying uh, the children. So next slide, please, Ronald. 
uh, aside from those um, very important findings, we also have other findings that we need to be really consistent about the terms we use, especially in Indonesia, we're going to use child marriage instead of uh, early marriage, for example, because it gives a really clear distinction on what a child is and uh, on marriage itself. So we are adjusting it to the legal frameworks and also with the context in Indonesia. Um, but however, uh, as we see that stopping child marriage and changing any other social norms for that case cannot be done instantly. So it needs to be done in a long term. Stopping child marriage also requires efforts in various levels. So it will not work if you only work with the youth, for example, or with the legal framework itself. So it needs a, a holistic combined approach to really end child marriage. Um, we see from the discussion with the youth especially that the village government and village community actually holds a crucial position when it comes to the uh, ending child marriage or condoning child marriage in this case. So if, if we want to have a lasting effect on the girls, we need to engage with the village government and village community because they are the ones who are most close to the uh, potential victims, but also that they are the ones who holds the most power to change the social norms itself. So youth involvement also needs to be done strategically and systematically. Uh, youth needs critical education efforts, which is done in a creative manner, because otherwise um, they will see it as old-fashioned and not really interesting. Uh, Aside from that, there are also other uh, people who are trying to tell them that child marriage is cool. So efforts to ensure them that it's not cool also needs to be cool. So uh, last but not least, this is not new, but it's really important also that patriarchal va values are very prevalent among, even among the participants. So even with these youth that are actually have been engaged before in general programming or have been at least uh, exposed to um, gender uh, understandings. There are still some uh, sexism and patriarchal values which they don't see as a problem. So that shows that uh, efforts to change the social norm is not an easy thing. Can we move on, please, or no? Okay, so based on our discussion with the youth, there are four main areas to intervene when we're talking about ending child marriage. The first one is policy improvement. We're talking about the, our national policy, but also equally as important, the local policy, especially in the village and district level. The second one is child or youth empowerment because uh, they themselves need to be aware of uh, the choices that they're making and the implications uh, of those choices. Uh, public service improvement is also really important because in lots of areas in Indonesia, uh, public service is not accessible economically and even physically. And the last one is mobilizing community supports for the youth, but also for the parents of the youth that are potential victims of the child marriage. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in connection to the previous slides on what to change, we also determine who we should uh, involve with and um, engage with when we're talking about ending child marriage. Uh, at the center of it all are the youth, because they are the ones who are most impacted. In order to enable the youth to be the leaders of this movement to end child marriage, they would need to have a room for expression, creation, and communication among themselves, but also with uh, other parties and stakeholders within their communities. Uh, the second one, they need proper education. Um, 
not only academical education but uh, also about uh, gender, uh, women's rights, human rights, and sexual reproductive and health rights. The second one is the family and community because the youth needs to be uh, supported in, in doing the in leading the changes on ending child marriage. We see that in the context of Indonesia, the youth thinks that the religious leader is very influential. So it's very important to engage them uh, to support these cause. So we need to be able to find the religious leaders who are uh, progressive enough to support the causes. Uh, all, but also the mass media needs to be uh, informed and engaged when it comes to uh, child marriage. They need to be aware that this issue is an uh, important issue and needs to, uh, uh, we, needs to be willing to give more uh, spotlight on, this, on the danger of this issue. But also there's a matter of giving education, not only to the youth, uh, but also within the family and the community. So education within the community, uh, meaning parents, is very important. Parents need to be engaged in this. Uh, and also the, the community as a whole. The last one is the state. So in lots of different layers of the states, there needs to be a legal reform for the uh, laws that are not yet supporting the efforts to end uh, child marriage, but also on the implementation, which requires uh, monitoring from the community to the pub public services. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so at the end of the day, the these uh, co-creation workshop that we're doing with the youth is contributing them to our uh, project, the Creating Spaces project, on how we should work with youth. So uh, we need to, as you can see from the uh, diagram, um, there are three things at least that needs to be done. The first one is the youth capacity needs to be increased. The second one needs to uh, change the norms that are believed by the communities, but let youth lead this process. And the last one is strengthen mechanism to protect youth against child marriage by working with uh, multiple stakeholders, especially in the village level, uh, and get their commitment and build their accountability on this issue. So the result from this, uh, uh, workshop are being used to enrich our design of the Creating Spaces project, but also because Oxfam uh, launched the Enough campaign on ending violence against women and girls. We use this to uh, basically build upon the existing findings and design the campaign strategy itself. So I think that's all for me. Sorry for the very short amount of time. Um, but if you have any questions, please write it down in the Google Docs. And over to you, Imogen. Thank you. Thanks very much, Cecilia. Um, for your very informative presentation. And you got a lot in um, within the short time frame. Um, and really interesting to hear about the different influences on social norms around um, legal institutions, media, religious leaders, and family, other young people, etc. Um, so I'm sure people have lots of questions. Um, again, we're just going to have a two-minute check-in um, so people can park their questions for Cecilia before we move on to the final presentation. Um, so again, if you can use the Google Doc, if you're not able to access the Google Doc, then um, some people have been using the chat box and Anya is going to be able to to copy those questions across. Um, I think some people have already started writing um, Jolly's already written a question. Um, yeah, a few people have started writing. So we'll just um, we'll carry on with the final presentation in one or two minutes.
Okay, I think um, the questions are starting to, to peter out. So um, we're going to move on to the final presentation now, um, which is from Arati Sharma. And she's going to talk about the um, consultative um, section reproductive health rights research, um, which again I think was carried out last, last May or June. Um, so I'll, I'll hand over to you now, Arati. Hello everyone. Namaste. I'm Arti from Oxfam in Nepal. Um, thank you, Imogen. Um, I'm going to present uh, on the findings of consultative SRHR research, which we conducted in last year. Uh, uh, so the research uh, enlightens the uh, findings on uh, child force and early marriage in Nepal. Uh, may I get the next slide? Hi, Ronald. May I get the next slide? Hi, Ravi. There's a tiny bit of delay in what you see uh, in terms of slides. Um, so I think you're still now. Um, on overview of research, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, uh, I'm going to present the overview of the SRHR research in Nepal. Uh, the research work uh, identified uh, many areas, uh, and the major areas are they uh, identified the key issues of child force and early marriages in Nepal. Uh, and the key actors for the uh, CFM, and um, it also clarified about the gaps in intervention strategies, which is from the side of government and the social actors. And the other thing the research identified is possible means to bridge the gap. And it also gave us the scenario of uh, successful and innovative existing practices which is being done by uh, social actors and civil society. And we conducted the research, uh, a total of six consultations, and the five, was, uh, five were conducted in five uh, regional, uh, uh, regional sectors and one in capital city Kathmandu. And a total of 242 youths and social activists uh, were participated in the research, uh, in the SRHR research. And we also conducted this grouping of uh, like-minded organizations which are working in the sector of child force and early marriages. May I get the next slide? And the major findings of the social factors uh, are uh, we found out the challenges to ch uh, changing traditional mindset, attitude, and behavior towards the CEFM. It's because government is very less uh, um, uh, attentive to the issue of child marriage. And Nepal is one of the highly prone country of child marriage. Other is uh, child force uh, and early marriage is rooted in socio-cultural practices and religious belief, socially accepted and culturally legitimated. It's because child marriage are the cases of uh, cultural uh, cultural stigma here in Nepal because people believe that if they uh, marry their child in early age, uh, it will uh, their place in heaven will be secured. That is the thing. Uh, that that's why they believe in marrying their uh, marrying them in early age. So it's very difficult to change their mindset. And the other thing is prevailing gender-based discrimination because we believe uh, the research also showcased that the uh, entry gate for all kind of violence is child marriage here in Nepal. And the other thing is perceived insecurity of girls in society. It's because. Uh, 
In Nepal, parents are insecure when their girl child is um, is being bigger because they uh, they think that uh, they think like uh, marrying them in early age is the one and only uh, escape for uh, escape. So. The other thing is marriage as a means of controlling sexual desire and behavior. The, this is the very interesting uh, uh, finding of that uh, consultative research that uh, uh, that the the region of uh, sexual desire and behavior also uh, promoting child marriage and the dowry system uh, mainly in the um, Tarai region of Nepal the dowry system is very much burning issue so uh, so uh, uh, escaping away from the dowry uh, pe uh, parents uh, marry their children in early age the other thing other finding of the research is lack of awareness of health risks and negative consequences of GFM. Through My Rights, My Voice too, we got the findings that the impact of child marriage in sexual and reproductive health rights is very high and this research also gave us the finding. And the other is lack of good parenting and caregiving. If uh, a girl marries uh, marries her uh, marries in child uh, in early age, uh, then obviously uh, she can't take care of her child uh, properly. So this is also one of the findings of the research. And the other is misuse of information technology and social norms. Uh, this is also uh, one factor that um, emerging uh, information technology is also one of the reasons for uh, uh, for children to get their, uh, get married by their choice. May I have the next slide? Uh, the other findings from the uh, level of governance factors are um, as below, like um, uh, weakness of vital registration of life at village development committees and municipal polity levels. It's because um, uh, in Nepal's constitution, uh, people uh, are uh, people are not allowed to get married, especially uh, under uh, eighteen under 20, but uh, once they get married, they bear children and they have to uh, register their uh, the children's birth at village uh, development committees, but it's kind of vice versa, you know. Uh, they give birth in early age and they go for the uh, birth registration, but uh, being the uh, early mother, uh, they face so many problems in registering their um, children's birth in uh, VTC label. So this is the uh, lack of uh, and vice versa policy of government in Nepal. The second is issues of a law enforcement. There is a law saying um, uh, people should not get, ma their, um, get married their children at early age, but uh, this policy is not being implemented well because uh, nobody is going to take action against them. That's why it's taking place. The other thing is responsible actors for preventing, eliminating child early and forced marriage. It's because uh, there are no many organizations or uh, government uh, service providers who are actively working for this issue. People have accepted this issue so commonly that's why nobody is going to take action against that. And the other gap, uh, other uh, findings from the governance side is gaps and beneficiaries in existing policies and program. Uh, sorry, gaps and deficiencies in existing policies and program. Uh, as I mentioned um, previously, there is a big gap between policy and implementation at uh, uh, at uh, field level. So. Um, it's um, the child marriage is 
that's taking place. And uh, interestingly, uh, unlike before, now children are taking initiation for their marriage uh, than their parents. That is another findings of the research. And the other thing is ineffective enforcement and implementation of existing law against child marriage. As I shared earlier, uh, uh, nobody is going to take action against child marriage if it occurs. So that is the reason people are uh, people are not scared of law and policy. Um, that's why it's ta uh, it's taking place. The next slide, please. And um, I'm going to share the findings from services and programming uh, point of view. And the research gave us the insight that inadequate of existing girls is scholarship and school meal program. It's um, it's like um, in rural sector of Nepal, uh, people are under poverty line and they can't afford their girls to go to school because of the meal. And government once implemented the um, implemented the program of uh, girls scholarship and uh, meal program at school but now it has been discontinued so uh, this is also you know, one gap from a uh, service side the other is poverty and lack of access to education and healthcare um, uh, this is the impact of um, this is the impact of uh, poverty again and um, uh, we have a uh, health uh, health post in village but uh, they are uh, they are like far from communities and they can't access the health services and um, access uh, uh, schools are um, far from the community as well so they can't access the quality education quality healthcare services and um, this is also the findings uh, we got from the hr hr research and the other thing is teachers' negligence on teaching sexual and reproductive health content in school. There are uh, sexual and health um, uh, health rights related uh, content in the uh, curriculum in Nepal, but normally uh, teachers are hesitant to teach the a particular topic to the children, they themselves are so shy. They are not technically um, technically sound in teaching those areas. That's why they normally skip, and the uh, the only chance uh, children get to know about the SRHR um, that uh, they are un, uh, they are underprivileged of that. That is the, another region of. Uh, uh, of uh, prevailing uh, CEFM in Nepal. And the other finding the SRHR research gap us is lack of adolescent sexual and reproductive health services, including female counselor in all health facilities. Um, unfortunately, I have to share that uh, uh, there are very few uh, uh, posts in uh, health posts in rural sector of Nepal. So. Uh, uh, though uh, there they should be in the health posts, but people are not uh, working properly, and government is not um, monitoring their services of service providers. So the uh, if the people are there, even they don't uh, work there, they go for. Uh, private clinics and other uh, other places uh, rather giving. Uh, services from the health post. So um, the other thing is uh, we don't have the provision of counselor in the health post. So this is the other reason that uh, why the children um, go for the child marriage and they don't have, uh, they, uh, they have no idea of the negative con uh, uh, consequences they will face in future. So the other thing we have got from the uh, research is lack of awareness raising program against CEFM. Um, this is now uh, very much accepted both in urban and rural sector that uh, government is working very less in the awareness part of the CEFM, um, it, uh, CEFM and its negative consequences. 
And the other thing is lack of targeted and focused intervention because now we have been a little bit hopeful that government is um, is uh, uh, is bringing one new policy um, on um, reduce uh, on eliminating child marriage and it's now going to uh, be implemented uh, from the year 2017. But till the date, there is no such uh, major interventions taken place. And the other thing is lack of multi-sectoral and integrated intervention. Actually, this is also an unfortunate because um, like Oxfam, other organizations also work um, for the, um, the CEFM, but uh, without having long-run program, uh, we, can't, uh, we can't contribute uh, in the multi-sectoral and integrated intervention because we normally have two, three years program. Uh, maximum of uh, the program la project life is uh, uh, four, five years. So if we work in the uh, particular area, then uh, that's uh, being done as, uh, by single organization, but integrated and uh, multi-sectoral program has not been, uh, been taken place. So this is also one uh, drawback for uh, a child force and early marriage in Nepal. Next slide, please. The implications for the program, the, um, uh, I'm going to present now the possible implications of the SRHR research we conducted last year for our long-term program in Oxfam in Nepal for Gender Justice Program Unit. Uh, so uh, this could be the la um, Nepal government has uh, given high priorities to CEFM now. Uh, the research findings have supported us to complement the strategy and plan of action finalization process as a CSO. Actually, government has um, government has already planned to introduce the uh, policy uh, for uh, child marriage, and fortunately, Oxfam is one of the actors uh, in the team to finalize its plan of action. So uh, the the research, the SRHR research, have given us the insight of uh, existing uh, uh, existing situation of child marriage in Nepal, and that and that is the most important uh, important uh, implication, I guess. And the second is the findings will help with future funding and programming within gender justice programs in Nepal. It has been already um, supporting us and we are very much hopeful that it will support us in future or two because we are implementing creating a spaces project right now and um, we are already Pretty privileged by the findings of the uh, SRHR research, and we know uh, in which area we have to focus through the uh, project. And the uh, um, other implication, possible implication, is it has provided a strong rationale for implementing pre implementing creating a spaces project. As I shared earlier, we have been equipped with the information on. Uh, child force and early marriage uh, because of the SRHR research before implementing creating a species project in Nepal. And the uh, last implication uh, is Oxfam in Nepal has given a high priority to SRHR and CEF in programming for upcoming five years through gender justice strategy. Actually, um, uh, uh, this is uh, one of the major implications of SRHR research for us because uh, this is our country strategy uh, planning year and uh, planning and implementation year and we have already incorporated the uh, the SRHR and CFM area thematic area in our PEEP um, due to the um, research work so uh, I think and uh, our all gender justice team feel like it's going to um, help us on Mm, on widening our insights for working on CEFM and SRHR area. Next slide, please. Um, 
this is the um, this is the these are the findings of the research we conducted and uh, thank you Imogen thank you Ronald for our, uh, for organizing this webinar to uh, to get uh, to let others know about the research work in Nepal Pakistan and Indonesia thank you so much I'll be happy to get your questions and uh, get the opportunity to uh, clarify that thank you Thanks very much, Arati. Um, thanks for the very detailed presentation, and I think we can see a lot of the, the same issues coming up throughout the presentation, especially around um, governance um, and socio-cultural and religious factors, um, and particularly um, around ICTs and social media in this presentation, so I'll be interested to find more out about that in the Q&A session. Um, so I'm going to direct you again to the Google Doc. Um, so some people have already been filling in some questions while Arati has been speaking, but if anyone else has any questions for Arati or any general questions as well, please do write them in now. Um, I'm, I think because of time I'm going to move straight on to um, asking Karen and Ronald to answer some questions from their presentation, but please do continue to, um, to add into the, the Q&A um, section on the Google Doc if you have any more questions. So if you scroll down to page five, we've put all the, the questions together from each of the, the three presentations. Um, so thank you very much to, to all of our four presenters um, for their three presentations um, from Pakistan, Indonesia and Nepal. So I'm going to hand over to um, Karen and Ronald now. So um, I've grouped the questions into three sections. Um, so one is around technical questions um, around the quantitative survey, which I think probably Karen can answer best. Um, so a question around the size of the survey, um, a, clarification, a clarification question on um, whether there are two separate groups thinking either for or against child marriage, um, and then a question where, um, and then some questions for um, and whether the study also covered minorities and whether that's going to be a future focus from the research, um, and then a couple of other more general questions. Um, so um, asking about whether. Um, these um, research findings have been backed up by other organizations, specifically mentioning PLAN there, um, and some questions about advocacy work, um, the link with education, and the role of government. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Karen first, if you can choose which of those questions you'd like to answer, especially around the, the technical questions, and then we'll move on to Ronald. Okay. Okay, thank you, Imogen, and thank you all for, um, of course, uh, asking me some questions. Um, so, first, the size of the survey. So, the size was, um, in total, if also, of course, the data collection of Punjab will be finished, and we've surveyed uh, 600 girls and 600 household uh, members of their household. Uh, this also links to the... Um, uh, third question, uh, who were the household members, only male or female, um, for Jolly? Um, well, we've, we've interviewed male members and female members. Uh, so I cannot explain, I, I cannot tell you now exactly how, how much of the household members were male and female, but there is, we have uh, answers from male and female. Um, also linked to the size of the survey and our respondents uh, in the survey, we've uh, incorporated a target group, so beneficiaries, or at least in this case, uh, girls who are participating in the project, and we've incorporated a comparison group of uh, girls who are not um, participating in the projects, but who are living in similar, similar uh, kind of circ circumstances. Uh, I hope this answers the, fir the first question and the third question. The second, are we correct in thinking that, are, that there are two separate groups thinking either for or against child marriage and less in mean? Um, well, I, I cannot really answer this question yet. Of course, if you look at the, the first four uh, results, um, you can you can say that you get the, that sense. However, um, for us, in order to really uh, answer this question, we need to look at um, all the data, like the, to the total amount of data, and then also look at, okay, who are those people who are answering this question? Because, of course, now we look at 
um, do they agree or do they not agree, and then we, we try to make sense of this data. However, we, then we need to see, okay, well, what is the age, what is the education level, uh, is it sort of a typical group who is answering uh, either for or against child marriage, are, are those people always the same, or, um, yeah, or do they answer differently in different questions? Uh, so yeah, so what is the um, what is the trend? But also uh, looking at all the different provinces and um, union councils, is there is that also is, do you do we also see a trend here per union council or province? Because this this will also of course influence uh, the outcomes. So uh, I hope I can answer this question uh, later on when I've uh, have more uh, analyzed more results and make sense of the data. Uh, I think, Ronald, do you want to answer the, the, the qualitative research questions? Yeah, thanks, Karen. Um, so thanks, everyone, for, for the interesting questions uh, asked. Um, so very briefly on, on the qualitative uh, research follow-up, it will be uh, a mixture of focus group discussions, community dialogues, um, some interactive activities with young people and in-depth interviews uh, with the main aim to get more insight into the exact drivers of, of child marriage. Um, so it's currently implemented, so we don't have the findings yet. Um, but what I can see now is that indeed um, we will dive uh, a bit deeper into uh, the exact social norms driving child marriage. Um, and if you look at the, the first question, the, the social norms condoning child marriage and also the the, one of the later questions from, from Jolly about looking into the root causes of social norms. Um, what we can say so far, also uh, coming out of the desk review, um, is that definitely the, the key um, like drivers behind the, behind the social norms uh, that, that can influence child marriage um, is the notion uh, of, of honor and, and tradition. And then specifically what drives that is that um, uh, very basically um, parents can um, opt to, to actually choose for, for child marriage um, simply to protect, for example, their daughters um, in terms of um, uh, their, their, uh, their sexuality. Um, so what we saw is that, um, um, for example, when, when a girl is, is not married, it is actually not done for her to have sexual relationships. Um, and if it does occur, then it can bring, uh, to a sense, like a big shame to, to the family. Um, but when she is married, then that risk is, is mitigated. So actually, in, in a way, for, for families and parents to actually uh, uh, protect their, their own notion of, of their family honor, um, marrying off your, your children early uh, is a good risk mitigation strategy. Uh, because once a girl is married, uh, she then engages in sexual relations, it's, it's no longer an issue. Um, so that was an interesting finding actually from, from the desk review about that we know that, that like traditions exist that, that drive uh, child marriage as a social norm, but then what is causing those traditions to, to still um, exist. Um, further, let's see the, the other questions. Um, so what is the link with education? Um, how many people think a girl should stay in school when she's married? Um, so indeed, this will also be taken up in uh, in uh, the, the quantitative survey, um, which we, we, we need to analyze further. And also in the qualitative research, it will be deeper um, uh, uh, sought after to, to further understand the link between education and child marriage. Um, what we can say so far is that the, the link between the two, um, so whenever child marriage occurs, then education stops or whenever education stops, the risk for child marriage increases. Um, that is, uh, in, in most studies conducted um, uh, across the world, um, there's a clear link between the two. Um, and also what is interesting is that there is a certain tipping point usually in, in access to education for, for girls, um, usually around the age of, of 14. And in Pakistan, we saw it in the best review at a bit lower, uh, around the age of 12, 13, where actually, um, um, their access to education uh, gets less and they actually drop out of school um, and it's also at that age then that um, the risk for, for child marriage for those girls uh, gets higher. Um, so what we, amongst others, try to, to investigate more is um, to, to increase our understanding of why exactly that the dropout of girls uh, increases around that age and how parents can be convinced actually to 
uh, to keep their children um, uh, in school and, and uh, increase the enrollment rates. Um, let's see other questions. Um, so one other question is about the uh, the minorities in Pakistan. Indeed, in the uh, quantitative survey, uh, it was more uh, to get the, the general overview, uh, the, the general samples of the communities. And in the qualitative um, study, we, we tried to uh, really get a representation from all the various groups in, in society, including the minorities that can be uh, religious, but, but also like the disenfranchised in terms of their socioeconomic status. Um, and then hopefully we can uh, identify um, perhaps even some key differences in terms of what drives child marriage or how child marriage exists in those specific communities to even further um, adapt uh, or our own strategies from a program how we will uh, work in those in those various uh, different communities um, I think um, most questions are also, I think there's still one left which I'm highlighting now. Are you correct in thinking that there are two separate groups, either for or against child marriage? Um, I, I don't think there are, that we can define that, that clearly. And I think that was also your, your uh, I think, purpose of asking this question because I don't think there's simply one group for, one group against, but it's more like the, the, um, the, the various drivers that, that drive it. <laughs> The various drivers that, that perpetuate child marriage um, are, are very fluent. Uh, it's very a multi-layered process. Um, so I don't think we can say that there is one specific group for or against child marriage in uh, in, in in Pakistan, for example. Um, but it will be more like the the more in-depth, um, uh, more complicated drivers that actually makes families decide. Um, to, to engage in child marriage um, or in marriage practices, um, which do not always necessarily mean that they, for example, agree with child marriage. It can also be a necessity, for example, economic necessity. Uh, um, so I don't think we, we can really speak of, um, uh, of uh, two separate groups. Um, Thanks, Ronald. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to cut you off there just because um, to make sure we have time for the other two presenters. But thank you very much um, to both of you, um, to Karen and Ronald, um, for answering those questions in such detail. Um, I'm going to move over to Cecilia now. Um, so we've grouped together the, the questions from Indonesia, I think, on, on page six of the, the Google Doc. Um, so there's a couple of questions around um, linkages with Oxfam's Empower Youth Work Program, um, which is in um, Indonesia, Bangladesh, um, Eth and Ethiopia. Um, so there's another question as well about um, the link with um, economic, um, the economic role in um, young women and girls' lives. Um, and then some technical questions about um, who the young people were um, who joined the co-creation workshop from Jolly. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Cecilia now. And if you could try and get your answers to five minutes to make sure that we have time for Arati as well. Try to do it in five minutes. So I think the, uh, first of all, hi, Olaria. It's nice to see you too. Uh, but in terms of the working with the Empower Youth for Work team, I have to admit that we haven't done as well. But we are discussing about uh, making uh, engaging them in the campaign, the, the youth that working with the Empower for Youth uh, project in our campaign against child marriage. So the second question uh, on employment, the, well, the connection is in almost all of the cases of child marriage, um, when a girl is wedded young, and even the boys, uh, they will be expelled from school. So it's very important for uh, us to ensure that they stay in school because without proper education, they get low quality jobs. And when they get divorced, especially for the girls, it can cause a big problems. So they cannot get a sustainable incomes and everything. What they're doing is we're trying to advocate the schools, but also the village government and village figures to uh, make sure that when a girl and boy is um, married uh, in the early age, they can still be accepted in schools. Um, 
and on a child book and flow test. Ah, okay, I'm going to come back to that. But the use that we the current appropriation is a mixture of urban and rural. But unfortunately, from our experience, even though in most areas, most urban areas, the youth were more reluctant to child marriage, this is not always the case because we have seen uh, places which is urban areas and even inside the Jakarta, the metropolitan, on the uh, urban poor communities where the child marriage is still quite uh, high. So, and what's even worse is that the issues in these areas are not given more um, focus in comparison to rural areas. So there's actually still cases uh, uh, that that issue as well. Um, recommendations, oh, okay. So practical recommendations, there's actually quite a few. For example, the policy improvement. We are aiming policy change, but also implementation and monitoring. But this will be done also through ensuring positive messages through media channels. In terms of youth empowerment, uh, it's very important for youth to have space to develop and express themselves, so creating those spaces through either art, formal and informal education but also ensuring that the education provided is a positive education, not the ones that are uh, making them scared on exploring their sexuality, their reproductive health, but the ones that are actually um, more positive. Uh, and also we see that different segments of youth, uh, like uh, what uh, Evelyn was saying, uh, urban and rural, uh, sorry, Jolie was saying, area has a very different context, so different segment of youth needs different approaches, uh, so we need to work on that. In terms of community support, it's very important to have a reinterpretation of religious teaching to ones that is more promoting gender justice. But also, it's very important to make the discussion of sex no longer taboo or sinful. So I guess this also uh, answers the Evelyn's question on uh, how the issues like ch the uh, child sexual education book is considered as uh, sinful or promoting sex. So actually, everything in Indonesia that even mention the word sex is considered promoting sex. So it's very important for us to change the these kind of uh, taboo and uh, restrictions and open a space for discussion. Not by saying sexual education uh, at the beginning, but from what we found in the field, uh, the safest way is go through the health uh, aspects of it all first and then work our way to the women's rights, sexual and reproductive health, and so on. Uh, yeah, oh, and, and specifically for the public service improvement, one of the uh, recommendation, the practical recommendation is ensuring that there are a minimal falsification of data because there are lots of identification data uh, that has been falsified uh, in order to ensure that a uh, child can get married. For example, they will make a fake idea that states that they are old enough to get married. So that, that is definitely an issue. Uh, to answer Kantika's question, Katinka, sorry, uh, on the role of mass media, I think the majority of mass media in, in Indonesia is not gender sensitive. So most of the time, child marriage incidences are reporting in a joking manner. So it's uh, treated as a joke or funny issue when, in fact, it's really serious. Uh, but also there are movies and books that are promoting uh, child marriage. It's different with the books uh, that previously mentioned, the ones on uh, sexual education. But uh, we even have a movie called early marriage, literally, a couple of years ago, it's a long time ago, which basically uh, profile a girl who were forced to marry early, and it turns out that 
she can have a life. And I think some of the it influenced the youth also to see that it's actually not a very scary prospect to be wedded early. But on a different note, uh, there have been efforts from activists to ensure that this issue receives more highlight, especially during the judicial review of the medical law. And also, government has also shown support uh, increasingly on this issue. So I think there's a bright light at the end of the tunnel, hopefully. Uh, the young people influence their parents and other stakeholders about their marriage. Yes, we have seen cases like that. It's not the majority, but this is actually one of the things that we want to encourage by educating the youth and empowering them so that they can have a discussion with their parents. Um, by saying that, it's not only the youth that needs to be empowered. The parents needs to be influenced to provide youth with spaces to have a dialogue as well. Um, I think that's it. Um, back to you, Imogen. Thanks very much, Cecilia, for managing to cover all those questions in a short period of time. <laughs> um, I'm going to hand over to Arati for the final section. Um, Arati, again, if you could try and keep this to five minutes, because um, we're about to run over time. Um, I think there are four questions for you. Um, a technical question from Karen about the type of methodology used. Um, a question from Audrey at Plan um, about whether questions were asked around um, girls marrying early and continuing education. Um, a question from um, Katinka about um, uh, clarification on what you meant by misuse of information technology and then a question from Charlie um, asking you to expand around um, what you said about implementation of laws. So I'll hand over to you now Rati and again yeah, if you could try and keep it keep it brief. Hi Rati, are you there? I think we might. Hi, yeah. Hi, Arati. Hello. Good. Sorry, I thought we'd lost yeah. you, but we can hear you okay. now. Okay. Um, as per the questions, uh, question from Karen on the methodology we used, um, we used the uh, consultation. Uh, consultation was the main method we uh, used, and um, uh, as as per the qualitative uh, research method, and. Um, uh, consultation uh, and it collected um, all the opinions and views from target groups and stakeholders about its um, child marriage law regulation policies and program as well as the intervention uh, we are uh, intervention that's uh, being uh, placed in Nepal and for the second question uh, from uh, Andre, uh, uh, the question is, were any question asked around the area of girls marrying? Yes, we asked um, about the uh, question, uh, we asked question about the uh, girls resuming their education again after the marriage, but uh, th this uh, is uh, quite obvious um, area of questioning in, in, uh, in the case of Nepal because after uh, once after getting married girls are deprived of school education they don't go to school due to the household reasons and the other reason of um, uh, getting uh, uh, getting different uh, feedbacks from other schoolmates and teachers like uh, you are already uh, you have already got married so why you are continuing school kind of thing they have to face at school that's why they they hardly go to school after getting married so it was also the findings we got from the research and the third question was from Siska uh, uh, the question was about the issues of the um, uh, technology, and for this, uh, we can uh, the research says like uh, access of the mobile phone and different social uh, um, different um, uh, social medias are the uh, are one of the causes 
of uh, child marriage in Nepal and it was uh, discussed uh, very widely in the consultation workshops because uh, Facebook, Instagram and um, other social networks has uh, uh, given so many, um, uh, so big areas for the promulgating uh, child marriage in Nepal. They get connected uh, from different places through social media and they just elope by choice and this has been the um, main cause, uh, this has been the prime cause of child marriage nowadays in Nepal. And for the third question, uh, for the third, uh, fourth question from uh, Jolie, uh, uh, have asked that uh, uh, about, um, to describe about the existing law and policy and age of child marriage. Uh, according to the new uh, policy of um, child, policy on child marriage, it says that 20 is the um, legal age for marrying for children, um, though 18 is the um, international uh, age of uh, a child and 16 in Nepal, it's quite contradictory, you know. Uh, they have said in policy like uh, the legal age of marriage is 20 now from 2017 and um, uh, though they are not children, there are no more children from their age of 16, uh, but it's being called child marriage when they get married even uh, at the age of 18 or 19. So this is uh, quite contradictory and uh, the main reason for uh, this kind of things t uh, being uh, uh, taking place is the poor implementation of legal actions and uh, um, uh, poor implementation of law and policy. Uh, at different levels, you know, uh, like in rural Nepal, nobody is going to take action though they marry in the age of 16 or 15. So people uh, normally don't believe in law and policy, they just do whatever they think like, uh, they uh, feel like. So it has been a kind of cultural taboo, cultural thing to get married in early age and it's um, as it's cultural thing, people don't dare to uh, raise questions about the um, uh, people who get uh, who marry their children at early age that is the thing and yes uh, there were so many good examples of uh, um, uh, uh, self initiate uh, not good, but examples of uh, self-initiated marriage and the other examples of um, successful practices of stopping child marriage too. And so if you wish, then we can share the uh, findings of uh, research uh, from the particular uh, section of uh, good examples to you later on. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Areti. Um, again, well done for answering all the questions in um, a short space of time. Um, we've come to the end of the webinar and we're running a little bit over. Unfortunately, we haven't had time to go to the discussion questions, um, but that's just the way it is sometimes. Um, but we've had some, some really good um, a really good Q&A session um, where we've been able to dig into the, the presentations a bit more. Um, so I'm really glad that we've been able to do that. Um, Rana, could you move to the very last slide? Um, so this has our um, contact details on. So as Arati just mentioned, um, there are some best case scenarios from Nepal which you could which you could share um, examples of instances and. Um, and strategies. Um, these are the email addresses for myself, Anya, Karen, Ronald, Arati and Cecilia. Um, so please do get in touch if there's anything else you'd like to know. Um, we'll also be um, sharing the recording from the webinar and um, answers to the Q&A session um, in the next few days, probably next week sometime. Um, so I just want to say thank you very much um, to our presenters, so to Ronald, Karen, Arati and Cecilia. And also, especially to Anya for um, for her moderation and for for getting up so early to join us. And thanks very much to our participants as well. Um, it's been a really lively session. So um, thanks very much for joining. And um, yeah, please do keep in touch um, and let us know if you have any of your own thoughts that you'd like to share, or if there's anything else that you'd like from us. <laughs>